Thank you everyone. Hope you are all fine and safe. As we all know, the pandemic has shifted our concept of seminars to webinars. Department of Zoology and Nature Club of All Saints College, Tiruvannathapuram, with much excitement and pleasure, conducts the third national webinar on environmental protection challenges and possibilities. We have already hosted two national webinars on taxonomy and human uh, animal conflict. This time too, we are overwhelmed by the responses from students, research scholars, teaching faculties and persons from various other areas. The topic of environmental protection has always in its relevance in all ages. Today, in the industrial and mechanical 21st century, development is the primary concern of human beings. Nature and environment are given least importance as we can see the recent issue from EIA bill. Today, we have with us an eminent speaker who can well handle this topic. Mm. Sunny, the former wildlife warden, is the right person to share his experiences and his knowledge about environmental protection and the challenges, especially in Kerala scenario. And the camera failed. Or... I fear I am taking a lot of time. So let me officially begin the national webinar on environmental protection. Oh, 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 oh. Conducted by the Department of the Nature Club of Olsen College. Dear friends, good afternoon. On this occasion, I am before you with extreme pleasure on behalf of the Department of Zoology and Purivi Nature Club to welcome all the participants of this national webinar on environmental protection challenges and possibilities. I am glad to respectfully and cordially welcome the manager, Mother Mary Francis, director, Sister Belinda Pereira, and sisters of the CCR congregation, who are an integral part of our college and have always supported the vision and mission of the college. I, on behalf of the Department of Zoology, students and all gathered here extend our, extend a warm welcome to all the members of the management to this national webinar. It is a matter of great pleasure and honor for me to welcome our dear respected principal, Dr. Deepa M, who is full of energy and enthusiasm with a key focus on education and learning, aiming to reach our institute to greater excellence. Welcome, ma'am. On behalf of Department of Zoology, students and all gathered here extend a very warm welcome to the national webinar. Now, introducing the speaker. Dr. A.O. Sunny, uh, Sri A.O. Sunny, a postgraduate in botany from St. Thomas College, Trishur. Sir is being interested in biodiversity conservation, is an active participant in Silent Valley movement. His interest focused on nature education fields and has conducted a number of camps, nature camps across Kerala. For a special mention, this is a special mention from the Department of Zoology All Saints College. Sir has always been a support for us in organizing the nature camp at various places like Peachy, uh, etc. And he has uh, uh, more than three years he has supported in organizing the nature camps for the students of All Saints College Zoology. And thank you so much, uh, sir, for that. And uh, for us, uh, then in 1990, he has joined Kerala Forest Department, has undergone forest forestry training at Gujarat Forest Rangers College, worked in Kerala Forest Department at various capacities, 
retired from service in 2019 as wildlife warden from PG. And uh, now his, uh, he rendered his service in nature education and, and helping people to understand the environmental issue and how to tackle the issue, especially his education. His, uh, his area is he's interested in uh, teaching or conveying his ideas about the environment, the importance of conservation, etc., to the students. That is the uh, next generation. And uh, that is what he's doing currently in Baldwin. And with, on behalf of the college, Department of Zoology, I welcome you, sir, this webinar. Thank you. On behalf of the program team, I extend a warm welcome and a gracious welcome to the head of the department, Dr. Dhanlakshmi T.G., the convener of the program, Dr. D. Shirley, Srimadhi Divya Grace Dilip, Faculty Department of Zoology, faculties, researchers, and students from various institutions in Kerala or in, from various institutions uh, across uh, different parts of India who have continuously supported us in our endeavor to spread the light of true knowledge and welcome once more to all the participants present here for the national webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Zilli. Dr. Dhanlakshmi TG, head of the Department of Zoology, also in college, the constant support and guide in our all endeavors. Let me now invite Dr. Dhanlakshmi to deliver the inaugural address. Welcome, Dhanlakshmi. Distinguished chief guest, respected Mr. A. O. Sunny, organizing secretary, Dr. Shirley D., manager, Mother Mary Francis, Director Dr. Belinda Pereira, the sisters of the congregation, faculties of the department, students and the participants representing various outstanding colleges and universities. A warm good afternoon to one and all. I am honored to be here to deliver the inaugural address for this national webinar on environmental protection, challenges and possibilities organized by the Department of Zoology and Kuruvi Nature Club of All Saints College. I am privileged and excited to understand that youthful faces with diverse potential and talent with extraordinary drive, ambition and above all commitment to excel have gathered here to attend the webinar. The objective of this webinar is very laudable as it is meant to prune more cooperative work by the society to protect our mother nature. The protection of the natural environment, biodiversity is one of the greatest civilization challenges of the 21st century. The challenges outweighs the prospects. The time has reached where the scientific and non-scientific community are realizing that the changes made on the globe are becoming almost irreversible and something must be done. The issues are mere symbols which show as in a mirror what we have done in the past. Biodiversity continues to decline globally despite a few encouraging achievements and increased policy action. Global requirement of food, energy and water systems are more vulnerable and fragile due to over exploitation and extraction of natural resources from ecosystems to meet the increased demand. Unsafe water, poor sanitation and hygienic conditions, urban outdoor air pollution and global climate change account for the increase in the incidence and distribution of infectious diseases affecting humans accounting for the major global diseases and deaths. The sea level rise observed in the present era due to global warming and the inflow of water from melting glaciers and ice sheets is a threat to the natural environment, which is a challenge faced by present and future generations. Ocean acidification produced by humankind since the Industrial Revolution has caused a significant change to ocean chemistry, which is a serious threat to 
organisms and will have implications for food webs and ecosystems, especially the tropical coral reefs. The challenges posed by air and water pollution, climate change, biodiversity loss, pressures on the marine and coastal environment, consumption and production patterns affect the human health and ecosystems across the region. This points to the need to identify and assess the main pressures from human activities such as tourism, transport and industry and their impacts on coastal and marine ecosystems and streamline environmental efforts about environmental sustainability as a common transboundary issues. This is the place where students have to take up responsibility in order to create awareness in the society and be the torch bearers for the forthcoming generations. This great challenge to find the balance between people's needs to lead a better life and protect the environment now understood to be the main task of the people in the 21st century is the spark for organizing this national webinar. We are honored to have as our chief guest respected Mr. A.O. Sunny, an experienced personality who have involved in various environmental issues like the Silent Valley Movement and has vast experience in organizing nature education programs. Today, we are privileged to have an opportunity to listen to him this evening. Let me conclude by wishing that each one of you will carry from here powerful messages that would be a great victory for both humanity and nature. Look deep into nature and then you will understand everything better. With this quote, I declare this national webinar on environmental protection challenges and possibilities open. Thank you all. Thank you, ma'am. Without any further delay, let me now welcome Mr. A. O. Sani. Today's chief guest to share his ideas and thoughts about environment protection, challenges and possibilities in present world. Welcome, sir. Okay, so uh, let us, uh, uh, first and foremost, I would thank everybody uh, for uh, this elaborate introduction and uh, uh, all these uh, participants, the principal, the teachers, and the, all the partners all over India. So welcome to my session. So and a very good afternoon. So let me share my ideas with all of you. And uh, I have a, a very small presentation. So I am planning to share some of my ideas. But after your interaction, I think it can be supplemented. Yes, so let us start. Today, as you told very clearly that today's our subject is environment protection, challenges and possibilities. Are you audible, madam? Hello? Yes, sir. Audible, audible. Yes, sir. Audible. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. So it is audible. There is no problem. Yeah, yeah. So environment protection, challenges, and possibilities. That is the today's topic. So whenever we are talking about environment, we can talk hours and hours, and even days and days, still the environment will be there as life. Nothing will happen. So environment protection, that has two parts, environment and protection. So before entering into the details of the subject, we have to know what is environment. That is very important. It is very important to know what is our environment. So in this session, I would like to uh, discuss certain matters. That is, what is our environment and what are the protection problems? What are the important problems faced by our environment? And what are its challenges? And what we can do? What are the possibilities? What are the remedial measures that could have been done? So this is in short included in my session. So environment, if you are going for environment definitions, we can find out n number of definitions. And every definition is based upon certain criteria. And mainly 
uh, I have taken here two criteria that is ecological and legal. Ecological criteria, the definition of this environment is the sum total of living, non living components, influences, and even surrounding and organism. So, environment is a simply speaking, very simply speaking, environment of an individual is the immediate surrounding. So the immediate surrounding of an, of an individual that includes both the living and the non-living factors and that components include the, all the living organisms and also the non-living factors. Living organisms include the same species and also the other species of the animals and also living plants and everything. And regarding abiotic components, everybody knows that it's very simple. Abiotic factor that is soil is there, water is there, air is there, humidity, sunlight, so etc. These are the abiotic factors surrounding an organism. So these are the environment, ecological terms. But in whenever we are coming to the legal terms, that has a somewhat a different meaning because a very in, in all legal aspects, the definitions have uh, somewhat very important meanings. Why? Because legality is a is an important measure to find out uh, the uh, solutions uh, how to handle these uh, problems. So, in legal terms, what is an environment? Environment includes water, air, and land, and the interrelationship which exists among and between water, air, and land. And human beings, other living creatures, plants, microorganisms, and property. Here is there is a change one from ecological definition. We can find out a change because environment includes water, air, land, and their interrelationships with the organisms, not only with the organisms, with the, with the property, with the living creatures and microorganisms, and even with the property. So this is the legal definition. Why is the property and everything has been included? Why? Because then, uh, and when we are dealing with the environment in a legal terms, this is having very much important. So in simple words, environment means the immediate surrounding of an organism that inputs both living components and non-living components. So this concept should be there because uh, whenever we are talking about the environment protection, we are always measuring the environment on the basis of human being only. How it is affecting us, how it is uh, interacting with us. But that is not the environmental issue. Environment is not, human being is not only the mere component of the environment. All other living and non-living organisms and their interrelationships are also an important part of this environment. So that concept should be there. Then, whenever we are talking about a protection, so what is the environment that I have explained? Whenever we are talking about a protection, protection of something, so uh, two things are coming. What is to be protected? And from what it is to be protected? What is to be protected? That is the environment that I have clearly explained. And from what it is to be protected? Whenever we are talking about a protection, definitely what it is to be protected from some issues, some problems. So environment is having or facing some problems. And from that problems, we have to protect the environment. Whenever we are uh, considering the problems of the environment, we can see n number of problems facing by our environment. But in short, I, I have listed that into three categories. That is, one is climate change, another is pollution, and another important problem facing by our environment is the deforestation that includes biodiversity damage and everything. So uh, the most all the problems can be enlisted in three categories. That is, one is the climate change, and another is the pollution, and the third one is the deforestation. 
climate change has been discussed in various platforms in various levels very extensively for the last so many years. So I'm not explaining it in so uh, deeply. The Palapolum Uruguard of Ethical Valia to the Church of the Vishayamana, the climate change, or the Ibrahim and another, yeah, Uddala Samayam and Venetia. Or a simple item, climate change. Yeah, climate change or global warming, these two terms are using synonymously. Everybody know it is because of a phenomenon that is greenhouse effect. Greenhouse effect, everybody know what is greenhouse effect. Greenhouse effect, that is gases. That gases are known as the greenhouse gases, GHG, including carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, hydrofluorocarbons, perfluorocarbons, sulfur, etc. Right? These GHG, these greenhouse gases has the capacity, has a phenomenon, has a property that it can absorb the heat rays. And these gases are found in our atmosphere. Whenever sunlight is passing through our atmosphere, the heat waves, the heat radiation, solar radiation, some of the solar radiation is reflecting from the outer atmosphere itself. Some is penetrating through this uh, atmosphere system and it reaches the surface of this earth. And some heat rays, that is infrared rays, they are reflecting back, radiating back from the surface of the earth. But the greenhouse gases has the property to absorb such heat radiation and it, can, it will return back to, again, back, back to the surface of the sand. So what happened means because of this, the uh, temperature of the earth surface is increasing. The greenhouse gases is essential for the earth. If such gases were not present in our atmosphere, the Average temperature of our earth would have been minus 18 degrees Celsius. So, greenhouse gases is essential. Yes. Am I clear? Yes. Hello, any, yes. is there any problem? Am I continuing? No problem, sir. Yeah, uh, some disturbances I have noticed. Okay. okay. So the greenhouse gases, uh, the uh, uh, the person, the concentration of the greenhouse gases should be there at up to certain limit. So what happened means till the, the before the industrial revolution, the last uh, the in nineteenth century, up to that industrial revolution, the concentration of the GHG in our atmosphere was somewhat okay. But after industrial revolution, a lot of factories has come, a lot of uh, industries has come, locomotives has come, a lot of so GHG emission has increased very much for, especially the uh, concentration of carbon dioxide. So GHG production after emission, GHG emission after industrial revolution has and have increased uh, many, many fold. Because of that, the greenhouse effect has increased. So because of that greenhouse effect, the temperature has been increased. For the last one century, it has been estimated that is an average one degree Celsius temperature has been increased. You might think about if one degree Celsius is a meager amount, but the accumulated heat effect is very, very high. What are the immediate, the GHG production, you see, especially the carbon dioxide emissions, per capita carbon dioxide emission, China is the biggest country, China is the country having GHG emission in high level, the quantity. But whenever we are taking about per capita, the per capita emission of carbon dioxide, it is very high in the United States, 16.5 metric ton per year. That is the per capita CO2 emission by the United States. China comes in the 17th position and the India comes in the 13th position. United States, then Australia, then Canada, Netherlands, Japan, like that. So this is interesting, sir. Developed countries are producing 
more GHG gases, especially carbon dioxide, per capita production is very high. And in developing countries and underdeveloped countries, uh, uh, the CO2 emissions are comparatively very less. So why? Why? Because CO2 emission is coming increasingly from the factories, developed factories and locomotives and uh, the vehicles are using by them. Uh, that is the combustion of the fossil fuel. So fossil fuel, they are using extensively by the developed countries. So that is why, especially the CO2 emission is very high in the developed countries because of their luxurious so the GHG, I already told you that GHG emission is a measure, so it should be curtailed. So many measures has been taken internationally, everybody know. So in uh, 1992 Rio at the summit, it was a crucial moment in it. Rio, that summit was held at Rio in uh, Brazil. So one, uh, one that is United Nations Framework Convention, UNFCC was formed in that at the summit. And in that at the summit, it was decided that every year such at the summit should be held. That is the convention of party COP COP. 25 such meetings, uh, such summits has been done. The COP 25th that was held in the last December in Madrid, Spain. And uh, very uh, interestingly, we have to, uh, we can see that it was a failure. The COP25 was a failure because the US President Donald Trump withdrawn from the Paris Agreement. And with the Paris Agreement, it was, uh, that is, a COP 2015. Uh, the UNMCC Convention on uh, 2015, an agreement has been recorded by the 196 parties, COP, the Convention of these parties. 196 parties, they have made an agreement at Paris. It was known as the Paris Agreement. This simply reduced, decreased the uh, temperature, average temperature of uh, Earth by 2 degrees Celsius. Two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. That is very important. Above the pre the level is the level is two degrees Celsius level that is before the pre-industrial period. Two degree. And it was decided that every year it should first by the increase by the increase of the temperature should be limited to maximum 1.5 degrees Celsius. That was the Paris Agreement. But the Paris Agreement, the United, uh, that is, uh, US President Donald Trump and some developed countries, some leaders of the developed countries, they have withdrawn from the Paris Agreement. They told that they cannot cope up with the conditions of the Paris Agreement. Why? Why? Because if they want to decrease uh, the global temperature by 2 degrees Celsius, they have to limit the GHG emission. How they can limit the GHG emission? That is, they have to close some of some factories, they have to reduce the use of the locomotives, they have to use, reduce, they have to decrease or reduce or regulate the use of the air conditioners, thereby they have to change their lifestyle. Much of luxuriant lifestyle is to be changed into another lifestyle. Where uh, people, the people of that developed countries, especially the capitalist countries, they are not ready to accept the conditions. That is why U.S. President and some other country leaders they have withdrawn from the Paris Agreement. So the COP25 was a fail. And now we come to another. Uh, that is that was about this uh, climate change. Now the climate change. Uh, the effect of the climate change, uh, uh, the various uh, adversities that we are seeing everywhere in this world because diseases are different, various diseases are coming, unknown diseases are, uh, unknown diseases are coming. Whenever the temperature increases, certain pathogens, they get 
the mutation will happen to certain pathogens. So they are coming. Uh, such pathogens are quite unfamiliar to the medical field. So the, such pathogens are coming. You know, now we, nowadays we know that certain new diseases, Nipah virus has uh, been affected in Kerala that we know. And uh, now we are undergoing about this uh, 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 COVID-19. So certain unknown diseases are coming, unknown pathogens are coming because of the changed climate. And certain, certain diseases that we have overcome, uh, we have uh, uh, succeeded to uh, eliminate such a disease from our society, like a malaria, smallpox, plague, etc. They are returning because the pathogens they have got mutation because of uh, mutation due to the change requirement. And they have made a certain new proteins. And our antibiotics are not effective to that new mutant ones. So they are coming, coming back to again. That is also another difficulty because of this climate change. And the catastrophe, uh, the disasters, the, the natural disasters, that is an another thing. Hurricanes, uh, landslides, uh, flood, uh, drought, everything. I am not a, uh, giving a detailed picture of it because it might have been discussed in various. Uh, so, climate change is a serious matter and it is happening because of the environmental problem. So, the, and our environment is facing the major problem facing by our environment is. Uh, the problems created by the environment, that is climate change. And regarding pollution, pollution is another area uh, that we have to give our attention. So what is pollution? If a certain case, certain substances found in our environment, which is harmful to our environment, environmental pollution means the presence in the environment of any environmental pollutant. If any environmental pollutant is present in our environment, that is environmental pollution. Then we have to then we have to find out what is environmental pollution. Environmental pollutant is a substance, either it's solid or liquid or gaseous substance, which is which found if it found in our environment in a certain concentration, it will become harmful, injurious to the environment. Then that is known as an environmental pollutant. That is simply if they are present in our environment beyond certain concentration, it is known as the air pollutant. If such a pollutant is present in our environment, that is the environment pollution. So then these are the uh, definitions of the pollution. And pollution, various kinds of pollution, water pollution, so air pollution, soil pollution, now sound pollution, so many kinds of pollution we can see. So in this regard, I would like to discuss uh, one important matter that is water pollution. Almost uh, all surface water, 70 percent of the surface water in India is unfit for consumption. It is a study. It is the study by the World Health Organization. The water is. Uh, 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 we know that water is a universal solvent. Universal solvent. Hence, almost. Uh, a number of uh, chemical substances, a number of substances will be dissolved into water readily. So, since it is a universal solvent, degree of pollution is very, very, very high because it can dissolve a number of substances. And the water is uh, polluting, water pollution is happening mainly by from two sources one is industrial sector from the domestic and from the domestic sector. The industrial sector and domestic sector, the effluents are directly discharging into the water bodies. That is the major reason for the pollution. As I told you, that 70% of surface water in India is unfit for consumption. It is uh, shown by a study of the World Health Organization. And a very interesting factor, as per the international norms, per capita water availability, Per capita water availability, if it is less than 1,700 cubic meter per year, that country is known as a water stressed country. Per capita water availability, 
less than 1,700 cubic meter per year. That country is termed as a water stressed country. The present stage in India, uh, the water availability, per capita water availability is 1,545 cubic meter only. We are already a water stressed country. And the study shows that our condition is so pathetic and we are leading into another, another part of the area. Because by 2050, 2050, the per capita availability of water in India would be 1,191 cubic Very slowly, very gradually, we are entering into a dry country, a water scarcity country. So this is the uh, water. And most of these rivers in, uh, in India is uh, uh, highly polluted. Know the pollution rates of uh, India, and it is being denoted, uh, denoted by the Water Quality Index (WQI). So, water quality indexes uh, that that has been discussed in various levels, but uh, I, I will discuss that later. So, this is about this water pollution, and this is another another thing that is air pollution. So, equally difficult, equally important, air pollution. What is air pollution? The presence of any harmful material in the air that adversely affects the human beings and their surrounding environment is termed as the air pollution. So any substances which is harmful to human and it is our surrounding, that is the, termed as the air pollution. So World Health Organization, uh, their uh, study shows that air pollution is 7 million people worldwide in every year. 7 million people, a huge number. 9 out of 10 people are breathing polluted air. So air pollution, how it is happening, air pollution, there is no need of any explanation how the air pollution is. From the industrial waste, industrial gases, uh, and from the domestic and agriculture sector, from everywhere, we can see that air is being polluted. The pollution control, central pollution control board and the state pollution control boards was established in the year 1794. They have set certain parameters, that are air quality parameters. Air quality parameters has been set by the pollution control boards. That is air uh, quality index, AQI, it is a number to represent what is the quality of the air. It is being fixed by uh, the uh, pollution control board. So the AQI, if you are uh, looking for a graph for the AQI, that is air quality index, 0 to 50. If the air AQI is 0 to 50, it is the good air. 51 to 100, satisfactory. And 101 to 200 moderate, 201 to 300 very poor, 301 to 400 very poor, 401 to 500 severe. So this is the uh, representation of the air quality index. And it is very interesting to see that what is the air quality index in major cities of India. In Delhi, the air quality index is 3 According to their classification, is this very poor. In Mumbai, it is 204, and in Chennai, 260 in the valid days, and it is poor. And in majority of the cities, the condition of the air quality is very, very poor. And that is the situation of, in India. And it is uh, the, uh, at present, uh, certain reports are coming because of this COVID 19, uh, since the locomotions and factories were closed for some time. Uh, due to the public lockdown, our atmospheres and uh, our uh, certain uh, cities has been uh, seemed somewhat cleaner than its previous times. But it is just uh, uh, just uh, just uh, for some time only now it will again coming into its importance. Now. Uh, I uh, discussed about the water pollution and uh, uh, this air pollution, then comes to soil pollution. Soil pollution, pollution you know, and uh, we know that a number of toxic chemicals and pollutants and contaminants are coming 
uh, from these uh, factories and industries and agriculture sector, even domestic waste. So these are contaminating the soil and that is soil and is here one that if you are going for that definition there is an interesting thing the presence of chemicals or pollutants or contaminants in soil in high enough concentrations to pose a risk to human health okay and or ecosystem this is very important why because you suppose if we are uh, dumping uh, certain uh, pollutants into in a remote area where uh, human inhabitations are not there. So uh, it will not create any pollution. That is our argument. But it is polluting the ecosystem, ecosystem the prevailing ecosystem of that area. So that is also included in the soil pollution. And some people or some governments or some local bodies are say, saying that since this uh, waste is dumping here, why? Because there is no human inhabitations nearby, so it is not creating any kind of the pollution or any kind of harm to the human health. But the ecosystem is damaged by such a pollution. So it is also included in soil pollution. So it is not only connected with the human habitations, it is also being connected with the that is very important. In uh, soil pollution, we can see two, uh, two agencies, natural pollutants are there and man-made pollutants are there. Natural pollutants, natural pollution may happen from volcano, landslides, hurricanes, etc. because of the natural reasons, natural disasters. Uh, sometimes the, volca uh, vol the volcano eruption, it expels a number of heavy metals, uh, a lot of other uh, substances, sulfur, and uh, some other organic and inorganic matters, ashes. So it is coming out. So what kind of eruption? Landslides also are happening as a cause of soil pollution, hurricanes and other tsunamis and other such things. So these are the natural pollutions. But man-made pollution, man-made pollution, in other words, xenobiotics pollution, xenobiotics. So man-made pollution is uh, is a very 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 immense. That is improper disposal. We know that improper disposal of industrial waste, industrial activities, agriculture, pesticides, fertilizers, radioactive pollutants, urban waste, etc., etc., etc. Very fair, we can see. Once the soil has been polluted, what are the effects of the soil contamination? The first thing, soil will be degraded. Soil degraded. So once the soil is degraded, the structure of the soil will be lost. Once the structure of the soil will be lost, all the properties of the soil will be lost. It cannot uh, ready, it cannot be able to support any living force. Any living force. So it cannot support agriculture. It will affect directly this food security. And then if the soil is dead, it is not having any microorganisms, it is not having uh, any organic matters, then it cannot hold water. Water retention capacity will be lost. So the soil becomes dead. In the very first shower, it will be uh, eroded. So the soil the degree of the soil erosion will be very high because of the contamination of the soil. So such contaminated soil in, uh, that is mixed with the water, it will be settled down into our water bodies clogged our water bodies, so it may cause the And since because of the sedimentation of such contaminated soil, the capacity of our water bodies will be reduced then during summer season, uh, that may lead into the severe drought. And another thing, this soil is mixed with the water and such contamination will be transferred from the soil to this water and water will be also and all of the life forms, so many life forms, that is the fishes, algae, plankton, and uh, so many life forms supported by such water bodies also be. When we are consuming such fishes and such water, such other uh, uh, creatures from the so such contaminated water, that contamination will also be transferred. 
recently or uh, we uh, some years back certain fishes from chalia river and they lure the desile of the disparia river uh, some diseases has been transferred from such a disease, such a fish to human beings so the reports has been stating that uh, some years back this it was a very uh, severe tropic in so and if uh, if such a soil if such a contaminated soil is not a supporting any vegetation you know if it is not a supporting our vegetation our entire agriculture sector will be collapsed so it will lead to the food security it will affect our food security it may create famine so we know what will be the after effects of it and certain diseases and health problems the soil everywhere everywhere and everybody is uh, uh, connected with this every agriculture and every persons every uh, living organisms or life forms other creatures everybody every every living organisms are in, uh, in touch with the soil so the diseases are transferring from such contaminated soil to the human beings and other creatures and another thing is if the structure of the soil is changed uh, the uh, the uh, support the life of forms which can be supported by such a soil will also be changed the ecosystem the concentration the uh, uh, condition of the ecosystem will be highly degraded it will be damaged if ecosystem damages the food chain will be disrupted we know that green plants are the primary producers of any ecosystem green plants are the only capable of living organisms which can trap the energy the solar energy and it is the entry point the green plants are the entry points of the energy into a ecosystem since the green plants are uh, not been supported by such a soil the energy cannot enter into an ecosystem that means the food chain and food will be completely this may lead into the extinction of some of the species So that it has already been happened in this way. And another problem facing by our environment is the deforestation. No need of any explanation how the deforestation affects our environment. Deforestation. What is deforestation? Deforestation is uh, the destroying of the forest. The right of deforestation between last that is 2015 and 2020. It's been estimated that one lakh square kilometer per year in an alarming speed, alarming, alarming rate. And Brazil is the worst. We know that in Brazil, the Amazon forests are burning, and that uh, wildfires are not uh, natural. It is deliberate, and their government is also encouraging such wildfires. And it is estimated that. For the last twelve months, a six thousand square kilometers of the tropical evergreen forest has been lost in Brazil. So the deforestation rate is very, very high in Brazil. In India, it is not good. It is also not good in that case. In India, for the last three decades, twenty-nine thousand square kilometers of forest has been lost. And each fifteen thousand square kilometer by encroachments, and fourteen thousand square kilometer diversion for various projects. Interestingly, these are the recorded documents recorded by the Forest Survey of India. And these are the recorded data. But you see, fourteen thousand square kilometer forest has been diverted for the projects. But after that, the illegal encroachments made by that projects has not been recorded. North India and especially Northeast India, certain certain areas has been diverted for the projects. Suppose if it is hundred square kilometer, but by years they might have been encroached into another hundred square kilometers, but it has not been done. So this data is from the data published by the Forest Survey of India. So fourteen thousand square kilometer or twenty nine thousand square kilometer in total is. The recordical figure, the unrecordical figures may be very, very high. That is very bad. 
for deforestation deforestation uh, what will happen uh, if the deforestation is that in when we are uh, talking about indian scenario what are the what are the main causes for the deforestation in india up to the coming of the british our forests were exploited in a little way for the modern day use by the local rulers by kings and local people not extensive exploitation has not been done in india but uh, that is in 19, but uh, the 19th century middle of the 19th century scientific forestry has been uh, taken place scientific forestry has been started especially in germany and a uh, high mechanization has been implemented in the forests uh, high machines logging machines the, uh, a boost was the uh, happened in the sector of the forest germany and the british people they have hired the german learned and experienced scientists in this field and the british men they uh, with the help of this german scientist german experienced person they have started this scientific commercial forest in india in 19th century they up to the uh, up to the entry of the british men our forest were not much exploited but when the uh, scientific commercial forest has been initiated by the british men uh, towards the uh, beginning of the 19th century the exploitation of the right of exploitation of our forest has been high for the increase in right and the british men exploited our forest for valuable timbers and uh, timbers to be supplied for timber based industries especially for the ship making and uh, you know in kerala when they have met scarcity of valuable timbers they have started the scientific silviculture in silviculture in southern parts they have started plantation of the teak and in north india they have started the plantation of the salt salt another valuable timber in uh, kerala uh, there is a uh, important history of the teak plantation it has been started on the bank of kalia uh, in nelambur by clearing natural forests uh, lots of areas of the natural forest uh, natural forest has been cleared and the teak has been planted in south kerala that is in uh, kollam that is ariyakkal area there also uh, so many natural forest has been cleared and the teak has been planted. so that was uh, uh, one of the uh, reason uh, for the uh, deforestation activity and another thing is expansion of the agriculture agriculture we know the agriculture production is a very less in, in in india when compared with other countries so the agriculture is to be expanded independence in 1948 and uh, in 1947 and 1948 a grow more food campaign has been initiated by the government grow more food that is a lot of forest areas has been cleared and it has been given on lease uh, for growing food crop such areas once that has been given on lease to uh, persons for agriculturist but it has never returned back to the forest department for the government for that has gone forever that also is the degree of the deforestation and the mining mining this small scale mining and high level mining in the say if you want to find out the severity of the mining you have to visit the northeast area certain mines you cannot see the and the, uh, the boundaries of the certain mines uh, uh, without the help of the binoculars and uh, in fact uh, originally the mining the area might have been given uh the uh, 100 square kilometers or 50 square kilometers some to set a hectare or name of square kilometers hectares 100 hectares or 50 hectares or even 10 hectares but now there is no limit for any their certain mining areas they are encroaching and encroaching and there is no record at all so such a very pathetic situation especially in uh, northeast area some of the hillocks has already been lost 
and the commercial logging that I already told you that the British men began the commercial logging in India extensively, extensively they have logged in uh, the Parambikulam, you know, Parambikulam to Chalakurdi farm where it is a, a, a very, very good example of the commercial logging. And dams, dams for the construction of the so many dams across the India. So very, very large quantity of the forest has been developed. Another reason for the, uh, the uh, forestation, that is the deforestation, is overgrazing. Grazing, overgrazing, so because of the overgrazing, the structure of the forest will be changed. Composition of the forest will be changed. Only fire hardy and these hardy species. And the quality of the forest will be reduced. And also the grazing also causes for the fire. And because of the tumbling effect, effect of uh, the cattle, the soil will be will become very compact. That will uh, adversely affect the regeneration. So uh, very soon the forest area will become a barren area. So over grazing is also a reason for the uh, deforestation and wild forest fires. As I told you that forest fires are 99% uh, of the forest fires are occurring because of the, uh, that is anthropogenic, that is man-made, either by the negligence of the man or by the deliberate action of the man. Forest fire and there is no need of any explanation for the uh, damages caused by the and last year, uh, last uh, this that uh, this year forest fire has uh, in in Tripur district in my home district three lives has been uh, spoiled because of the forest fire. The forest department lost three person because of the fire. The fire causing a lot of uh, problem because the vegetation will be changed, the soil will be uh, will become dead. It will. Uh, it will not support any living forms in future. It affects uh, the habitat loss of uh, the human wild animals. And also, uh, the, the soil becomes very hard and it cannot be able to hold water. water. So it may cause the flood, the soil erosion, flood, and everything. The forest fires is the most uh, important problem that our forest is now facing. So these are certain, some causes and the effects, you know, climate change. The, once the deforestation occurs, the, the forests are important carbon sinks. Forest, the soil and also the trees are important carbon sinks. If a deforestation occurs, the carbon sinks will be broken and the trees will releasing GHG in an increased It is calculated, estimated that 15% of GHG emission is due to the deforestation. And deforestation also emancipates the desertification. Desert, you see, once, one, it, once the tree cover is gained, uh, it is moved, removed from the surface of this earth, definitely it will lead into the desertification. Study shows that the desert is expanding to the heart of India. It will reach very soon uh, to the new So desertification is also uh, be initiated uh, by the default. Oil erosion, I already told you the consequences of this oil erosion. Half of its top soil lost in the last 150 years. Half of the earth's top soil it is the estimation done by the W. And also the flooding. The, uh, the forest, you know, the forest is the best water tank. Uh, best water storing area is the forest. And ever it is estimated that a wet evergreen forest, one hectare of wet evergreen forest can hold 2.5 lakhs of liters of water. It is estimated. Oh, and uh, because of the deforestation habitat loss, that will affect the wild animals to coming out of the forest, which leads to the human-animal conflict. 
Nowadays, the human man animal conflict is increased in Kerala. That matter has been discussed very uh, detailed in the by Dr. Isas and the last session. Uh, Majority, why this uh, wild animals are coming out is mainly because of the habitat loss. So these are some effects of the deforestation. What are the measures taken for in this world? Whenever we are talking about the environmental issues, the most important moment in this world that is 1972 storm. It was the first environmental convention held in, in the world, the, uh, the World Summit that uh, has discussed about the human environment. That was uh, held at June 5th to 16th in 1972 at Stockholm, the capital of this Sweden. 122 countries participated in that convention. And the important uh, outcome of the convention, it has created the UN, the United Nations Environment Program. And June 5th, since that, and, uh, that convention has started on June 5th, that convention decided that every year June 5th will be celebrated as the World Environment Day. Now, even now, we are celebrating uh, the June 5th as the World Environment Day. And, uh, that convention discussed the various uh, environmental problems, especially atom bomb issue. So many environmental problems, uh, that is biodiversity degradation, everything. And they have made a declaration of uh, 26 principles of action. That declaration has been circulated among this one to the two countries and it has been published. And another important outcome of that Convention is the convention suggested the participant countries to make appropriate legislation for the protection of the environment. Environment protection will be uh, appropriate uh, legislation of the other countries. The participant countries should make appropriate legislation for the uh, protection of the environment. Some countries. Uh, they have immediately made uh, some uh, legislation, but India kept it not for some time. Then the major important uh, step taken in India is uh, 1974 Water Prevention and Control of Pollution Act. 1974. That was an uh, important step taken by the government, central government. So this is an act to prevent the prevent and control the water pollution. 1974. Water Prevention and Control of Pollution Act. So it's a very important uh, provision. You see, sewage or pollutants cannot be discharged into water bodies, including lakes, and it is the duty of the State Pollution Control Board to intervene and stop such activity. Very clear provision has been made in the Water Act 1974. No person or company is allowed to discharge image or other pollutants to the water directly and it is the uh, the authority is the state pollution control boards to intervene it and they can proceed with the legal issues cp uh, cb that is the central pollution control board and spcb state pollution control board such two bodies has been formula formed based on uh, the water act and some powers has been assigned to that that authorities. So it is very interesting to uh, see this Water Act. You all, everybody should go through the water, the various provisions of the Water Act in 1974. And punishment also be incurred in that act. The punishment that is, if somebody, some person, or any company is to contravene the provisions of that act, it will be uh, there will be uh, the punishment will be. Imprisonment which shall be not less than one and a half year and which may extend to six years and with the fine. So various uh, sections are there, various sections having different uh, different uh, punishments, various uh, fine is incorporated in that. It's very interesting to see that. And that, uh, the Pollution Control Board of uh, Central and uh, the state, they will uh, they will uh, fix the standards of water quality. 
WQI is water quality index. Water quality index is a number which it represents the quality of the drinking water. If the WQI water quality index is less than 50, it is excellent water. Is, uh, between 50 and 100 is good water. 100 to 200 is poor water. 200 to 30 very poor water. And less than 300, greater than uh, 300 water unsuitable for people. And in India, uh, uh, major, the water of the major rivers are coming between 100 to 300 level. Is poor or very poor? 70% of our surface water is already been polluted than I already told. So this is the water condition. And another act that is, that is in 1981 act, that is Air Prevention and Control of Pollution Act, Air Act that is in 1981, to control and prevent the air pollution. In this act, this is also very important. This act provides that this government may after consultation with the state board by notification, declare any area or areas within the state as air pollution control areas. This is very important. Government, state government, after consultation with the pollution control board, can declare any area as that is air pollution control areas. If they declare certain areas as air pollution control areas, that means certain certain activities cannot be undertaken there. They can regulate it or completely stop certain activities there. So certain areas they can declare as air pollution control areas. The powers has been given by you. And another thing, no person or industry shall emit air pollutants above the standard set by the pollution control board. For this, the board can even approach court to get a restraining order on the industry that fails to meet its standards. Suppose if some industry is emitting a certain pollutants beyond the standards fixed by the Pollution Control Board, then Pollution Control Board can approach the court and take an induction order to stop immediately stoppage of the activities of that, uh, that fact. The, uh, the act is giving such a power to Pollution Control Board that can intervene. And here also punishment has been incurred one and a half year and which may extend to six years with the fine. If somebody or some, if, uh, some persons or company when having the provisions of this act, if they are violating the provisions of this act, uh, that, uh, that such persons or company will be convicted by uh, the imprisonment one and a half year, not less than one and a half years, which may extend to six years with the fine. So Water Act and Air Act are very strong. And another important and most important, till 1984, not much uh, discussion or not much steps has been taken by the government to address the environmental issues. But in 1984, everybody knows the Bhopal gas tragedy has Union Carbide Company May the ISO sign it uh, that has been uh, leaked out from that factory, it killed thousands of people. It was a huge tragedy in the independent India, uh, India uh, that was uh, one of the major tragedy happened in 1984. But once that happened, then our experts and scientists and the uh, leaders and political leaders and government authorities has discussed how to then only we came to know that there is no any, any powerful act or any act which will be enable the government to meet or enable or which will force uh, the agency to give the compensation to the big kids. So it became a very huge legal matter. Then the government decided that a uh, uh, effective environmental act should be enacted in order to cover such issues in India. So by that, they, uh, actually the 1984 Bhopal tragedy was uh, the uh, force behind the enactment of the Environmental Protection Act in 1986. We should, uh, we should remember that in, during 1972, 
in the uh, that is the Stockholm Convention, it has given a very clear cut suggestion that uh, the appropriate legislation should be taken by the countries in order to protect the environment. But till 1986 or till 80, 1984, after the Bhopal tragedy, India didn't take any much any steps in this regard. Only after 1984 Bhopal tragedy, we think about it. And Environmental Protection Act 1986, the most powerful act of the environmental issues in Kerala, environmental planning in India has been enacted in the year 1986. Uh, so the, uh, uh, this act has given immense power to the central government to take such measures to protect and improve it or it. And uh, they can, uh, the government can lay down standards for the quality of environment in various aspects, as I already told you. Laying down standards for the emission or discharge of the environment pollutants from various sources. So the Environmental Protection Act gives immense power to central government to set the standards, the pollution standards, protection standards. So such a power has been given or entrusted to the government. The central government has the power for the closure, prohibition or regulation of any industry operational process. If the government found that some factory is so, so some factory, uh, the pollution level of some factory is very high. And the, if, uh, if the, some factory is functioning and they are violating by uh, uh, by the, the provisions of this Environmental Protection Act, if the central government found that, then that factory can be closed, can be closed, prohibited or regulated by uh, central government. So such a power is also can be sanctioned uh, by this act. Profit and uh, the supply of electricity and other energy forms can be stopped by the government. And another interesting thing that if some uh, tragedy happens, some accident happened because of this factory, if uh, some of uh, some accident, suppose uh, like this Bhopal tragedy, if such a tragedy happened, accident happened, the government needs to be uh, undertaken certain remedial measures, the reliefs, remedial measures uh, uh, such as hospital treatment, reliefs, rehabilitation. A huge amount of money is to be invested for this purpose. That money, that expense with its interest can be recovered from the person concerned or from the uh, company concerned by the government. So uh, such a provision is, uh, that provision is very, very important. If a company for a, or a person has committed or violated the rules and which may lead into such an accident, the expenses made by the, uh, the government for the remedial measures that can be recovered from such authority, uh, recovered from such agency, such person or such company. And uh, it's a very, a very, very crucial provision incorporated in the uh, Wildlife Green Bay Environmental Protection Act, EPA. And the punishment also in imprisonment up to five years or fine up to one lakh or And if uh, such a violation is continuing, the contravention is continuous and it is not been recovered by the company. Uh, or uh, it is not been uh, remit, uh, not been uh, cleared by the company. Then five thousand rupees per day, five thousand rupees per day is the fine. And even after one year, still uh, that violation is continuing. The imprisonment may uh, raise from five years to seven years. And the cognizance of the case can be taken by the officers as well. Authorized that is the pollution control board officers at any. This is another important provision. If such a violation has been noticed by a person, any person, any any person, myself or you, the participants or any person, they can give a notice to the central government or pollution control board, the secretaries of the Ministry of the Environment or State Secretary. If they give 60 days notice and within 60 days notice, after receiving uh, the notice, 
within 60 days the other if these authorities are not taking any uh, measures any legal measures then this person can approach this can be done by the ngos uh, they usually this is done being done by the ngos and approaching court for the measures uh, legal measures since the authorities are not taking and now comes to EIA. EIA, it is a very widely discussed uh, in India, especially in Kerala, very recently. So before that, what is EIA? Environmental Impact Assessment. It is a EIA, EIA notification that was uh, done in the year 1994 by the central government. It is uh, based on the provisions and besides in section three of the Environmental Protection Act 1980s. Section three of Environmental Protection Act, it clearly states that before starting any such project, an environmental impact assessment study must be done by the authorities, uh, by the concerned uh, authorities. And um, uh, environmental impact assessment study also be submitted along with the EIA project. Then only the environmental clearance will be given after this group. So environmental impact assessment is published as you know, a notification based on the Environmental Protection Act of 1986. It was published in uh, 1994. That notification was issued and it is on uh, 2006. And now in 2020, 2020, recently the government has put forward a draft environmental impact assessment. So before that, what are the important provisions of the environment impact assessment? Every development project has been required to go through the EPA process for obtaining environmental clearance ever since. Ever since that is 1994 onwards, every project would have the obtained an environmental impact assessment report before uh, starting before degree, before starting that project. That is before getting uh, before starting. They, they will uh, they will obtain the environmental clearance from the central government. Then only they can start the such a business. That was the environmental impact assessment uh, notification. In, so, uh, how this environment impact assessment notification will be done? Yeah, if uh, uh, some company is, uh, is some person or some uh, company is going to start, they will invite uh, the, the, that is the pollution control board. They will invite the objection from the public. From the public means the persons to whom that project will affect directly. Invite objection. And uh, uh, after that, they will conduct a public hearing. Public hearing, not less than a notice giving 30 days in the way. 30, 13 days time. 30 days. Not 30, 30 days in the way, not less than 30 days. So after conducting this uh, uh, public hearing, the DPR, that is the detailed project report, then EIA report, public objections, public hearing reports, and then NOC from Pollution Control and other relevant records uh, to impact, the, that records should be submitted to the Impact Assessment Agency, IAA, appointed by the Ministry of Environment and The IAA, that is uh, the Impact Assessment Authority may consult the experts, may visit this area, they can conduct detailed study, interact with the affected people, all within 90 days, and then they will scrutinize the application and they will take a decision. Uh, it can be whether uh, the sanction, the environmental clearance can be given or not. So clearance will be given only, the validity is uh, only five years. So, so many procedures need to be covered uh, by, the, uh, by the company, uh, by the project owners, to get the environmental clearance. So, Environmental Protection Act and the Environmental Impact Assessment Notification is very clear and it is very clearly stated what are the procedures to be done before starting the business. It has been amended in the year 2006 and uh, 
uh, it has uh, loosened. This amendment is also loosened. But the major problem happened in the EIA 2020. The major changes. What are the major changes occurred in the EIA 2020? This is very interesting to see because uh, now the government is acting as uh, uh, not environment friendly but a business friendly. That can very clearly seen uh, in the policy change that is reflected in EIA 2020. What are the major changes? I already told you that EIA uh, 2006, 1994 and 2006 says that public hearings should be done uh, uh, not less than, uh, like issuing notice not less than 30 days. That 30 days has been reduced to 20 days. And even it can be done by uh, video conference. Video conference is always enough. All the public can raise their objections by video. And even in, even now, this 30 days is not enough. How the uh, public uh, will study about this project and its adverse impacts within 30 days and will submit. Whenever I have attended so, uh, the public hearing of the other uh, also. So in that public hearing, the, uh, the project authorities are coming with all the, all the data because they have been studying and uh, they have been using it for so many years. But the people, the affected people, they are getting only 30 days. How they can uh, submit their data? How they can represent? How uh, how uh, how they can represent their data? So, so even the 30 days are not enough, and that has been reduced to 20 days. And even video conference is enough. And except then another thing, uh, up to 20,000 square meter. Projects, they, they, the projects are uh, the projects that need up to twenty thousand square meter area. Up to twenty thousand square meter area has been exempted into the in uh, EIA. But now the draft proposal it has been changed immensely, the twenty thousand to one point five lakh square meter. Just to think about who is going to build such a building for one point five lakh square meter. It is a very huge uh, project. So it is exempt. Up to 1.5 lakh square meter projects has been exempted for getting the environmental clearance. And the answer is very interesting thing is that in environmental impact assessment reports of the uh, notifications earlier, uh, the, uh, this, uh, the projects has been categorized into A and B categories. A category which is a major project which is need the uh, environmental uh, which required the environmental clearance and b again divided to b1 and b2 b1 uh, that also required the environmental clearance from the state pollution control board a is exclusively from the central pollution control board category a and category b that is b1 is a state uh, pollution control board and b2 is uh, totally exempted getting environmental clearance. Now what happened means some of the uh, projects coming under A category and also B1 category has been changed, has been incorporated into the B2 category and it is fully accepted. Very simple, very easy method. Because the A1, A category and B1 category has been uh, shifted to B2 category projects uh, in order to avoid uh, the procedures of getting the environmental clearance. So such projects can be done, can be started without getting any environmental clearance. And another, the NH and state highway are completely exempted for getting the environmental clearance. So, you know, the NH national highway and state highway, some of the national highway and state highway is passing through even the protocol. Uh, sanctuaries and national forests. They didn't need any uh, environmental clearance certificate nowadays. That is another proposal. And another uh, the very interesting proposal is that post facto approval training within two years. In uh, former EIA notification, I have already told you that in order to begin, before beginning uh, uh, the project's environmental clearance should be taken. Now, uh, uh, now it is very very interestingly, 
uh, it is saying that post facto approval is given. You can start your project and you get the environmental clearance after starting within two years only. Once you have invested close of amount to start a business and you, within two years you are approaching the environmental clearance, uh, approaching the authorities to get the environmental clearance, but uh, uh, by norms uh, you are not able to get the environment clearance certificate, but at the same time you are saying that I have invested cross and cross or rupees. Then a leniency should be there. Okay, you continue. Certain regulations they not. So post facto approval is a very, very, very uh, easy way uh, to start any project without getting any environmental clearance. So, and they will get uh, environmental clearance in future very easy. And every project they should uh, submit an evaluation and monitoring report within six months. Once the project has been started, they should give a report. Uh, by That is, uh, every six months they would submit a report how it is functioning, whether they have violated the, uh, the provision in six months. Now it has been changed into one year. So uh, it will get one year period uh, for this company to run at any level. And uh, the report can be so the monitoring report can be submitted only once. And violation, this is a very interesting. If some company violated the provisions of the Environmental Protection Act and the Environmental Impact Assessment uh, or Environmental Protection Act, the provisions of the Environmental Protection or other Environmental Act, that has been noticed by a public, a public cannot give any notice or uh, the public cannot raise that matter in front of the pollution control board or any other agency. The, the owner, the owner of the company, the person, he himself should report. Interesting thing. Kallan katta mogale kattu enna kallane kuttu enna parayi pikkunna kallan enna parayal maathrame chiyam Then only, uh, then only it can be proceeded with the legal matter. Legal so the, the company should say that we have violated such a such a way. The company authority should say, and no public can point out such violations. That is also a very interesting uh, change or interesting proposal incorporated in the area. And another important thing is that regarding strategic projects, strategic projects didn't require the environmental clearance certificate. And what are the strategic projects? That is not been defined by the government. That is interesting. The government can declare any projects as a strategic project. It is not a defined. Normal case, the strategic projects are uh, the defense related projects. But nowadays, the government, now on first, the government can declare any projects as a strategic projects and it will get it can be started without getting any environmental clearance certificates. So these are the major uh, changes uh, in the proposals uh, given by the EIA to draft. And uh, it has a very interesting history that we should know why such a EIA 2020 draft has been uh, put forward by this government. When this government, NDA government, came into force in 2014, a high level committee has been constituted under the Tema of the ESR Subramanian in order to review the, the existing environment laws in India in the year uh, 2014. The committee, uh, they have made a report. That report, uh, they have given uh, so many suggestions. Uh, in order to uh, make India a, a business-friendly country. But the Parliamentary Committee, Standing Committee, they completely rejected uh, the recommendations given by the uh, high level. But the government was so determined. Then the government decided the recommendations of the high level, uh, high, uh, the, uh, uh, high level committee should be uh, implemented in some other way and that is the result and it is resulted in the EAA 
basically almost all the suggestions or the recommendations made by the high level committee appointed by the uh, modi government in 2004 it is reflecting in eia 2020 that is the interesting history of the eia 2020 and we need to get the projects i already told you that certain uh, projects has been included into b2 category uh, that projects uh, which were already been there in category a and category b1 it has been changed into b2 category it is very interesting because gas oil shale exploration hydroelectric projects up to 25 megawatt irrigation projects between 2000 to 10000 hectares of command area small and medium mineral a uh, unit small foundries uh, involving farmers units small and medium cement plant cement factory small clinger grinding units acids other than phosphoric or ammonia sulfuric acid micro sports synthetic rubber mini size paint you see so many such projects which definitely need environmental clearance certificate such uh, such projects which is causing a lot of which is causing a adverse effect upon the uh, public such such projects has been changed shifted from category a and category b1 to category b2 category b2 is totally exempted of getting environmental clearance so the intention of the government is very very clear and for uh, is another important uh, change if uh, somebody is uh, uh, running a business a project and they will decide to modernize it or expand it if that expansion is not more than 25% of the existing project it will really need any eia if it is uh, if it is over than 50% then only uh, another public hearing is to be conducted So up to 25 percent of expansion can be done by the company at any time without any environmental clearance, and up to 50 percent of the expansion can be done without any public hearing. That is another interesting change which has uh, incurred in this EIA too. And EIA draft uh, in 2020, it is I told you that is environment friendly, not environment friendly. It is business friendly. Why? Because it is a measure of ease of business ranking. Ease of business ranking is a measure of a country how it, uh, business friendly that country is. When this uh, India government took in force in 2014, the ease of business ranking of India was 134. Now it is 63. That is the latest uh, ranking done by the World Bank. So you, we can see that almost. Uh, Uh, that is in the, increased by uh, more than half. Well, it was 134 in 2014. Now India is uh, 63. The government is so determined to uh, reach maybe uh, rank one. So now India is a business friendly country rather than the environmental friendly country. So we can very clearly understand why such a EIA draft 2020 has been put forward by the uh, government. And now, uh, this is the question: What we can do? I am uh, so. If we are living in such a country, if we are concerned about the environment, what we can do? This is a question. So the uh, once this EIA draft 2020 has been put forward, a wider range of, of protest has been happened, especially in Kerala media. And the environmental activist and even the layman, a wide discussion has been taken. The protest. So there was a time limit for submitting our protest by August 11. I hope that some of the participants or most of the participants of this webinar might have been uh, uh, submitted your uh, protest, and so that we can do. And then another awareness campaign. so awareness campaign is very important because most of the lamen they are not much bother about this environment in fact but they uh, may be the affected so they should be teach they should be uh, they should be given uh, what are the consequences of the project if it comes to existence so awareness campaign said protest is like 
that the strike is also very important because it will pressurize the policy makers to change their policy. So otherwise, uh, if there is no protest from any or uh, any circle, uh, they will continue with their policy. So uh, we should uh, raise our voice, pressurize the policy makers, and media intervention is another matter. It is very important because in in, in India and especially in Kerala, media is uh, having a very 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 important role in our day to day life. So media intervention should be uh, done uh, as far as possible. Uh, the media intervention is a very important tool to make the awareness among the people and among the policy makers. And then legal remedies. I, I already told you that if uh, there is a strong provision in the Environmental Protection Act, if we are some violations has been noticed by anybody, they can approach court after giving a notice of in Asia. So the remedial measures also. So this, these are uh, certain uh, measures that we can do in order to overcome uh, the problems of the environment. And to my conclusion, uh, I am uh, very interestingly asking to you how environment, uh, environment friendly, not environmentally, environment friendly we are. That is the, that is a simple question. That I am, I would like to ask. See, I am presenting here in this webinar, and a lot of uh, participants are participating and hearing me. And uh, I am asking, uh, very frankly, I am asking. I am uh, presenting this uh, uh, this topic here. You are uh, participating it. We are discussing it. Okay, everything is okay, and the government the policy making everything was okay. And if you are thinking and if you are asking personally, how environmentally, uh, uh, how environmentally friendly we are living, what is the way of our life? Suppose, uh, take, the, take a day, you are waking up uh, in the early morning. And the first thing I think everybody is going to for a urinate. And after urination, we will uh, flush. Five liters of water it would have been done by two liters of water. For so three liters of water, we are spoiling each other. And if a five-member uh, family, three into five, that is 15 liters. Adrenating, you are spoiling 15 liters of water. And if you are doing it twice or thrice, that is 45 liters of water. So one day you can sell, you could have sell 45 liters of water. It is not bad. And regarding baths, one bucket of water that is 10 liters is enough. But we are using three or five times more than that. That is 20 or 25 liters of water we are spoiling. And uh, if uh, uh, five people are there in a family, 125 liters of water per day they are spoiling. So, how eco-friendly we are living and energy use you see if uh, four members are there in a family the four are reading or they are busy with their mobiles in four rooms and four lights or four fan it would have been done in a hall with the two lights uh, maximum two fans could have been save a lot of energy and food waste you see food we are uh, you are you thinking about the waste of food happening in your uh, your very home? Have you uh, think about? You see, food is uh, when uh, when we are. Uh, have you thinking about how this rice or other food materials are coming on your table? A lot of energy, a lot of water, a lot of uh, 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 that is uh, a lot of money. So a lot of energy. See, in certain foreign countries, if you are ordering something from the hotels, you have to give this money. And if you are not taking full, if you are uh, putting some paste, if you are uh, keeping some paste in your plate, you uh, you will be given a uh, compensation to that. But not only for uh, buying the uh, the uh, this food and some fine, you have to remit uh, for the waste of the waste committed by you. 
So then regarding the waste disposal, how many of you are segregating your organic waste and recycled uh, uh, plastic waste in your farm? Whether you are keeping two different buckets to keep it, and whether you are uh, uh, decomposing, whether you are disposing your organic waste in your, your farm study itself, and whether you are uh, giving the recycling uh, plastic to recycling centers, how you are disposing your waste, and how many waste you are creating, whether you are carrying any uh, cloth bag or any other carry bag of, uh, whenever you are going for the purchase, how eco-friendly you are living, and whether you are uh, avoiding the plastics and use the alternatives. And you see, this is the fan I am using for the last three years. And this fan is the ink fan I am using for the last three years. And we are, uh, nowadays we are using the plastic fan, one fan for one week only. And less paper, less disposable. Every function we can say disposable glasses. How this disposable glass is coming and tissue paper is coming basically from the trees, a lot of energy, a lot of GHG emission. And we are in our public, our private vehicles now. This is especially due to this COVID okay, Otherwise, use the transport for primarily the cheap landing that particular day. And we are taking the very next day, we are forgetting it. What happened to it? Whether anybody is uh, confident that I have planted this in the 2019, I have planted this in 2018, 2017, 2015. Can you show the present stage of it now? How many of you are bothered about it? Uh, so instead, I am very uh, confident that instead of planting thousand seedlings, you plant just a can and protect and so. So this is a question. Uh, okay, we can conduct a number of these seminars, a number of seminars and discussions that we prepare. Uh, we can argue uh, for the policy and policy changing everything is okay. That is good, you know. But at the same time, uh, in our personal life, how people can we are. Uh, we are how eco friendly life we are. So, simply it is very simple that uh, cut short as maximum as possible uh, the luxury and coming and uh, choose an eco friendly life. That is the only, that is only one uh, important way, uh, important family that can be incorporated by a person. And at the same time, uh, we should pressurize the policy makers. We should take all other remedial measures in order to protect our uh, the environment because uh, now, nowadays uh, we need uh, the living situations of our world is very, very, very pathetic. Even now we are not getting clear air and clear water and what would be the fate of our nation. So be eco-friendly, be Lead an eco friendly uh, life and also be very, very uh, active in the uh, environmental issues, environmental force. And with this, I am concluding my session. And uh, uh, I thank everybody. And you can ask any questions or interaction, or you can rather supplement uh, my talk. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for the enlightening and enriching speech. Now the participants can ask the, ask the questions to the Hello? Yes. Hello. Yes. Is 
there any question? Whether I have taken more time? No, sir. Everyone is saying very interesting. Yes. Very useful, wonderful session. Good comments are coming. Thank you. But no questions are not, not yet asked by the participants. Hello. No question? Rather than the question, they can interact with their experiences and uh, yeah. uh, they can supplement uh, or they can point out some more points if they have to share. That is also very interesting. That would be. Hello. Um, uh, Shirley, can I ask a question? It's not. It's just as a doubt. Actually, it's not a question. Okay, I just need to get something cleared. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, so I was just wondering. Usually, uh, all these uh, bills and all regarding environment protection, everything. Uh, the people's opinion is asked after a draft has been. The people's suggestions and opinions. Once a draft has been prepared by a group of uh, scientists and environmentalists and other concerned authorities, it is then that the public opinion is sought. Uh, isn't that uh, how it is no, done? Actually, uh, in order to get the environmental clearance, uh, hmm. the environmental impact assessment is to be done. Yes. Okay. The environmental impact assessment, uh, uh, one important component of the environmental impact assessment is the public hearing. The public hearing is being done by the Pollution Control Board under the chairmanship uh, under presence of the uh, concerned district collectors. Okay. Actually, the uh, public hearing is not being convened by the uh, project authority. So okay. They are only one of the participants, oh. the uh, NGOs and the people uh, who are directly affecting by this, uh, uh, this project. Uh, and interested parties, uh, environmentalists, uh, uh, the media persons, uh, so such and such persons, uh, uh, all profiles of our society can participate in that public hearing. That public hearing is also being evaluated by the impact assessment agency. Mm -hmm. Then only uh, they are giving the permission. This is the legal measures that I have been pointed out. But pathetically in India, what is happening means uh, very, very recently, they want to, to explain yeah. some bits I will say. Very recently in Vishadu mm. Patanam, this uh, 7th May, mm. 7th May in Vishadu Patanam, the uh, uh, LG polymers gas leak has happened and 11 persons have been killed around the has been injured in Vishagapatana, in Andhra. The same in the company was formed in the year 1960. And uh, then it has been uh, shifted, the ownership has been shifted to various, various persons. And uh, now it is being run by the LG, the Korean mm -hmm. has happened. The Pollution Control Board authorities has inspected a, a company and they have, uh, uh, where they have monitored, uh, they have evaluated and they have uh, checked all the documents. Okay. Very interesting fact is that that company has not been taken the environmental clearance so far. Oh, the SP uh, started in the year uh, 90, uh, that is 1961. And in 2006, uh, that is in 2006, uh, uh, up to from 2006 onwards, it was a must for that company to take the environmental clearance from the central government. But now, yeah. uh, when this uh, accident has happened, and the authorities said, so I'm checked uh, the documents. Mm -hmm. Only we came to know that this company is functioning for years without taking the environmental clearance. Mm -hmm. 
The same is the case in Assam oil well. Mm. Uh, there the oil in the limited, oil in the limited okay. is doing uh, uh, doing such activities. There also happened, uh, that is uh, uh, one, uh, uh, May 27th, an accident has happened. Some people have been killed and thousands of people have been evacuated. There are so many wells, uh, that is oil wells in there around 20 or 21 wells there. The accident has happened in the fifth well. And very interestingly, the Indian government has accepted, uh, that was uh, in January 18th, this uh, uh, 2020, January 18th, the Indian government has accepted to take any environmental clearance certificate for uh, exploration drilling okay. for the uh, oil companies. Now, that company is safe because the government has given exemption. exemption, yeah. exemption. That has been given in the January 18th of this uh, this year. Okay. So, it is not the lack of the uh, legal uh, enactments. It is not the lack of the enactments. It is the lack of the awareness and the interventions of the public. Okay. That is the problem in India. Clear? Yes, thank you. Thank you very yes. much. Okay. Any other doubts? Anybody else? I think there are no more questions. And that is the end of the interactive session. And now I, I welcome Srimadhi Divya Grace Tilly. To extend the word of thanks on behalf of the department. Department of Zoology. Okay. Ah, yes, yes. Audible and visible. Ah, audible and visible. Yeah. Respected resource person of today's webinar, Sri Sani, a practicing environmentalist, Dr. Dhanlakshmi HOD, Department of Zoology, Orsins College, colleagues, and dear students. I have been bestowed with the duty of proposing the vote of thanks to all all those involved in making this webinar a success. First, I extend a sincere gratitude to Sri Sunny for accepting our invitation and addressing all of us who participated in this webinar. Sir, your thorough and detailed presentation was highly informative. You uh, explained many points of which we had only a vague idea and now we have thrown light upon it and helped us to comprehend our heartfelt gratitude and was and constantly guiding and motivating us. Thanks are due to the faculty of the Department of Zoology, All Saints College, for enthusiastically organizing such academic programs for the benefit of the students and other lifelong learners. Special thanks are due to Dr. Shirley for constantly coming up with ideas that are workable and carrying them through and thus working for the welfare of the college and the department in general and the student community in particular. Thank you, Dr. Shirley. Thank you, Ms. Kartiga for the te uh, technical support that ensured that the webinar was well organized and was completed smoothly. Now, I extend our warmest thanks to all the participants of this webinar. Without your enthusiastic participation, all our efforts would have been in vain. Thank you. Above all, thanks to God Almighty for his loving kindness and guidance for, for right from the beginning of this webinar until it was planned, until its successful completion. Once again, thank you all. Have a good day.